Hey everybody, this video is called Saul's First Victory, and tonight we're continuing our pass-through study here in the book of 1 Samuel, where we're looking at the 11th chapter where Saul is defeating the Ammonites. So chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, it says, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. All the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition, I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. So Nahash, it means snake, and he was the king of the Amorites, Ammonites and the descendants of Lot, and they lived in the east of the Jordan. And Jabash Gilead was a town east of the Jordan River that was approximately 22 miles south of the Sea of Galilee and the tribal territory of Manasseh. And putting out all your right eyes was a barbaric mutilation and it was a common type of punishment that was used at this time period by tyrants back in the ancient Near East. And it what it would do is gouging their eyes out would disable the warrior's depth perception and outer vision. And it would render them pretty much useless in battles. And the Ammonites, they surrounded Jabesh Gilead, calling Israel to surrender and to be captured. And the men of Jabesh knew that they had to surrender to, to Nahash under the agreed terms, or they would be killed and plundered. And the men, of, the men were knuckleheads instead of getting right with God. They just offer themselves here as servants and this uh nahash he demands them to gouge their right out their right eye out to bring glory to himself to glorify himself and you know it'd be a very humiliating practice that these men in the city would do in all of israel if nahash gets his way and half blinding the men would bring reproach on israel by all of Israel, by making them look weak and unable to prevent such a cruel act. I mean, if we all just went around and gouge our eyes out for some crazy tyrant, you know, over us, I mean, you look like a knucklehead. And the most commonly, it would prevent the men to be able to fight effectively in battle if they were to rise up against the Ammonites. And in verse 3, it says, Then the elders of Jabash said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the elders of Jabash were hoping for deliverance from the Israelites west of the Jordan. And they knew that they must have a Savior. And though looking... Or though losing an eye seems less scary than losing your life, it is still a pretty big deal to want to give up your eye for a false sense of security. In verse 4 and 5 says, So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. So Saul's home and first capital city of the monarchy was Gibeah. And it was approximately three miles north of Jerusalem. And Saul, he continued to work as a farmer while waiting for the time to answer Israel's expectations of him as the king. And Saul was appointed king, but he had to wait for God's timing for him to fully take over the, the ring. And he didn't have to promote himself. God would promote him. And this takes place between the time of Samuel and before Saul becomes king. And at this point in time, as Judges 21-25 leads, uh, leaves off, that there was no established government. And Israel and Israel, uh, Saul, he had to hear of the threat uh, between second and third party wise. 
in verse 6 through 8 says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and he rose this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel, by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. While When he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. So we see that the Spirit of God came upon Saul to deliver the citizens of Jabesh, Gilead. And Saul divided the oxen, the oxen into sections to be taken throughout Israel to rouse the people for battle that was similarly done back in the book of Judges 19.29. And Bezek was a city that was 13 miles north of Shechem and 17 miles west of Jabesh Gilead. And the distinction made between Israel and Judah before the kingdom was divided indicates that the book was written sometime after 931 BC when the kingdom had been divided. And we see good and spirit-led anger within Saul out of a righteous concern for the cause of the Lord among his people. And Saul's efforts they worked as the people came out to follow behind Saul. And verse 9 through 11 says, And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by this time the sun is hot, you shall have help. Then the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. So it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered, that no two of them were left to gather. So the men of Jabesh Gilead heard someone was coming to take a stand and it made them glad. We see that Saul's army deceived Nahash as if they would surrender to Nahash, making his army to become complacent and to become unprepared. And Saul puts the soldiers in the three companies while he was planning the attack before the battle started. And though Saul's action and by God's blessing, the victory was total. And Nahash and his army, they are completely defeated at this point. And the last military watch was almost like what we did back in the army during basic training. They had a thing called fire guard. It was to be on watch. And this would take place around 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And now when I was in the army, the fire guard or the night watch, we would, you know, rotate by hours, you know, besides when you're in your regular military units and you do CQ or uh, whatever the other one was called. But the last military watch was between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. And they carried out a surprise attack on the Ammonites while they were asleep. In verse 12 and 13 says, Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he who said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. So Saul's supporters, they wanted to expose and kill those who did not support their wanted king before. And Saul wisely knew that this wasn't a time to take revenge on those who offended him. He recognized the deliverance of the Lord and he refused to kill those who had rebelled against his kingship as the Lord accomplished salvation in Israel. 
in verse 14, 15, wrapping up the chapter here, says, Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So renew the kingdom was the reaffirmation of Saul's kingship by public admiration. And all the people came to crown Saul as king that day. And the process of entering the kingship was the same for both King Saul and both for King David. And they were commissioned by the Lord and they were confirmed by the military and crowned. And remember, as we went through the law of Moses, that peace offerings were sacrifices of thanksgiving, as you see back in Leviticus 7.13. And along with the great victory over the Ammonites, there was a great celebration over the nation being united at this point. So to wrap up our study, we're going to keep this one shorter today. We looked at Nahash, the Ammonite, who gave such a gruesome demand to the Israelite city. And when I think of Nahash, when I study this chapter, I think of someone that is a spiritual representation of our enemy, Satan. And, you know, he wants us to serve him and he will intimidate us into giving into him self. And he wants to humiliate us and exaltation for himself over us. And he wants to bring reproach on God's people. Nahash is like a picture of Satan. And Satan wants to blind us. And most importantly, Nahash means serpent or snake, which we know from the book of Genesis that Satan is referred to as a serpent. So you can see a lot of similarities between King Nahash and Satan. And we see that the elders of Jabash Gilead answered Nahash. And we saw that Saul heard the predicament of Jabesh Gilead. Gilead. And we saw that Saul responds with anger. And it wasn't a sinful anger, it was a righteous anger. And he gathers the army as he was zealous for Israel's cause. And I want to look at a verse. Uh, many times in our walk as Christians, we think it's wrong or a sin to get angry. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You see, Paul doesn't say, be angry not as you'll, you'll be in sin. He says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let your anger become unrighteous by doing something that is out of selfishness and righteous anger is to show concern for the cause of the Lord among his people and as believers you know we need to have a righteous anger toward the things that go against God and the ways of God you know we we should have a righteous anger against the abortion mills and the politicians that you know, enforce or, you know, the politicians that are endorsing the genocide of babies. You know, those things go against God because God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. And, you know, we need to hate the things that God hates. And we looked at Nahash, the Ammonites' defeat. And we see Saul's humility as he shows mercy to his to those who were against him. And we see that the chapter ends with Saul's acceptance as king by the entire nation. We see a nice little end in here where they're celebrating this moment. And that's going to wrap up for today's video. We will see you Saturday. There will be no topical video this Saturday. We're going to continue with chapter 12 as we'll look at Samuel's speech at the coronation. So I hope you have a Great rest of your evening. We'll see you this weekend. God bless.